Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Tech Kick webinars, our endeavor to empower techies. We believe that sharing of knowledge is the key of enhancing our performances and for our growth as professionals. With this principle in mind, Tech Gig has initiated a series of webinars conducted by industry experts to give a crisp insight of various domains. Topic for today's session is Adopting Scrum, a case study involving transition, implementation, challenges and benefits. We are delighted to have Mr. Deepak Vijay Raghavan, Senior Manager Delivery at Nest Technologies with us today. Deepak has over 13 years of industry experience in senior delivery program management in information technology spanning diverse industries, domains and technologies mostly in Java, J2E, in life sciences and BFSI. He has over four years of experience practicing and implementing Scrum at various levels as Ness Agile Coach. Gentlemen, this presentation will continue for next 45 minutes and we will take your questions after the presentation. In the meanwhile, you can post your queries through the chat pane available in the webinar software. Without further ado, I introduce you to our guest speaker, Mr. Deepak. Hello everybody, uh, this is Deepak, this is Deepak Vijay Raghun. Uh, 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 I, think I, uh, I think the introduction has already been made, so I'll quickly jump on the uh, main set of slides. Uh, I have been uh, uh, practicing Scrum for the past five years, uh, so my session is basically going to revolve around uh, my experiences in adopting Scrum and also implementing Scrum and set of challenges that I have faced over a period of five years. Uh, so I'm hoping that this session would be useful for all those people who are new to Scrum and also those people uh, who are already using Scrum but then they have a set of challenges which they would want to be get at risk uh, in, this, in this presentation. Uh, uh, so going over uh, uh, my agenda, uh, I would be basically speaking about uh, the slides for the next one hour and uh, the last 15 minutes would be for question and answer. So please send all your questions to the moderator and we'll take it forward. Uh, the agenda for today would be kind of uh, three, threefold. Uh, one is basically introduction to Scrum Agile uh, and some of the development process uh, uh, and uh, some of the changes that we require to adopt to Scrum and also uh, where exactly uh, you know you can actually uh, use Scrum uh, or rather where exactly Scrum is most suitable uh, is one of the things that would, would, I would be covering. And uh, I would also be covering in the second part where I would be covering the case study where I would be talking about some of the best practices that I have used uh, uh, over a period of five years which has helped us to deliver uh, uh, software and products uh, consistently with, with uh, good quality. Uh, uh, towards, the la towards the end, I would be basically drilling upon uh, you know, the other important or kind of a, 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 a end thing uh, a majority of the, uh, of the software industry is focusing on is uh, distributed environment and how Scrum can actually be used in the distributed environment and some of the ground rules that I'll be talking about in this. And lastly, uh, 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 you know, I'll be ending towards uh, uh, talking about critical success factors, uh, some of the benefits of return on investments on Scrum and uh, some of the anti-patterns that we have to be very careful on while implementing uh, Scrum as, as we say, right? It's, Scrum is not a, it's, it's not a panacea, it's kind of, it's not, it cannot cure everything. Uh, so we have to be careful in uh, finding those anti-patterns and why we are actually executing projects. So for all those people who are new to Scrum, I'll, I'll touch upon some of the Agile Manifesto. Uh, uh, it, it's based on four values of Agile, uh, uh, like customer collaboration is highly important than contract negotiation. Individuals and interactions are highly important than process and tools. Uh, uh, Agile basically focuses on human-centric uh, or intellectual capital uh, in delivering software. It believes that software is, is built by people and not processes and tools. Uh, uh, the next set of values is it believes that uh, what is important for, for, for delivery is a working software uh, instead of you know, the, the processes or the tools or the documentation that kind of revolves around uh, developing a software. Uh, lastly, and uh, most important is responding to change than following a plan. It says that uh, 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 change is great, 
uh, compared to the earlier set of methodologies where we talk about chain management, chain control boards. Uh, Scrum basically says embrace change uh, 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 as much as possible and then bring value to the customer by working closely instead of following a very, very rigid plan uh, which is not very customer uh, centric. Uh, some of the other things I just wanted to kind of briefly talk about here is uh, pillars of agile which are kind of highly adaptable development approach. So you inspect, you see what are the things that worked well for you, what are the things that did not go well and then start adapting to your, uh, in your iteration. So the, the iteration that you're probably working on is probably a two week or a four week iteration. So you start thinking about or doing lessons learned exercise where you say what are the things that did go well, what are the things that did not go well and quickly adapt in the next iteration which happens in the next two to four weeks. So every two to four weeks you have something to kind of improve upon based on how the earlier iterations went on. As I said it's also highly human centric uh, and majority of the principles and processes are actually revolves around human centric uh, uh, humans rather than processes and tools. Uh, collaboration is another phenomenon or principle that that Scrum highly uh, kind of talks about uh, uh, for for as a critical success factor. Uh, some of the other things are uh, early testing and early release of softwares, which the customer can see. Uh, automation, uh, one of the pillar or one of the tenet of Agile is uh, a lot of automation and increasing the efficiency uh, across all the things that we do within an iteration, not just QA. Uh, early feedback is very important. Uh, we develop software, but we also want uh, quick early feedbacks from the customer so that we can adapt uh, very quickly and then bring in value to the customer. Lastly, which is kind of a lot of debates which keep going on in terms of, when you talk about conference and documentation is not required, it's, it's important to understand when we actually uh, bring in the culture of Agile or Scrum, uh, and when we talk about Scrum and things like that, we talk about the important thing that note here is we talk about minimum of everything. We talk about minimum of process, minimum of tools, minimum of documentation, but not no documentation or no process or no tools. That's that's something that or no plans or project plans. It's important to note. It's important to also propagate to every individual that is practicing Scrum. Uh, so it's, uh, it's the earlier set of methodologies uh, on uh, documenting or using process or tools or metrics or plans. Those are still valid. But uh, the only thing that Agile or Scrum talks about is have a very, very minimal uh, set of documentation or plans that, uh, to execute the software. What is most important is working software at the end of the day. Uh, Scrum framework, it's a very uh, lightweight process for managing and controlling software and product development. It basically embraces change, so it, it is highly suitable for a rapidly changing environment typically for a product development where uh, the uncertainties or complexities are much more than a service industry. Uh, uh, it is based on a framework which I just talked about, it's inspect uh, what you did in the last iteration and then start adapting very quickly uh, to bring in value and then do a continuous improvement uh, in your deliveries. It has uh, three roles, five ceremonies and three artifacts, uh, which uh, all the people who are kind of new to the, uh, to the Scrum uh, should kind of remember and then start practicing. Uh, roles, product owner, scrum master and team. Uh, I have specifically underlined team because uh, this is a big cultural change uh, or a change of mindset that happens when we kind of transition from a typical waterfall or other set of methodologies to a scrum methodology. What is important uh, in, in scrum or agile is team uh, and that's a message that we keep giving uh, to all those people who are kind of transitioning from the older methodology to a new methodology. We still have a lot of conflicts, uh, which we talk about when we talk about pitfalls and all, which we have to be very careful. But then, what is important is team, uh, team and team. Uh, so, so certain ceremonies, uh, which are very important uh, to uh, to understand, is sprint planning, uh, backlog grooming, daily scrum, sprint review and retrospect. I'll I'll talk about each of these during the course of the presentation, but I just wanted to give a kind of a context in terms of where it fits in the scrum framework. Uh, there are basically three artifacts that all of us have to remem uh, remember while we are executing Scrum projects. Product backlogs, sprint backlogs and burn down charts uh, 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 in terms of artifacts. I also would want to kind of talk about a kind of a message that I keep giving to all, all the practitioners, all the team members who work on Scrum is 
uh, don't be afraid to use Scrum. The worst mistake that we could actually do is probably do for weeks, uh, and we have the option to adapt. So, and one other thing is doing it, doing it wrongly, uh, doing it, doing it wrong faster. It's much more. It's much better than doing things wrongly uh, slowly, which was which was the usual case when we were actually developing older waterfall or other set of models. Uh, so, so, so develop software uh, uh, in quicker iterations, uh, learn from the mistakes, and then adapt to those, uh, adapt in the next iteration is what Scrum framework is all about. Uh, mechanics of Scrum are very high level, uh, again, for all those who are new to Scrum. Uh, as I said, there are only three uh, 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 roles in Scrum, a product owner, uh, a scrum master and the team, uh, which is what is maintained here. There are uh, 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 certain set of uh, so many that happen, which I just talked about, uh, like sprint planning, uh, daily scrums, and also the review and retrospect that we do uh, within the sprint. So uh, quickly on this, uh, basically the product owner or the product sponsor or the product manager, he basically owns the entire set of requirements of the product backlogs. So he starts maintaining this product backlog and also the release backlog. And uh, uh, from that, a sprint backlog is developed, which basically becomes part of the sprint uh, uh, execution. And then, uh, uh, then the sprint starts, wherein uh, the entire team basically every day spends on a daily scrum, where they talk about basically three set of questions uh, in a span of 15 minutes, ground rule. And uh, and during the process, they also collaborate through uh, wikis and phones or calls and uh, meetings and things like that. And they finally deliver a potentially shippable product, which is kind of a, uh, a jargon that is used in Scrum, uh, which, which finally it says that it's kind of a potentially shippable product after every iteration. Also, uh, before the sprint ends or the, at the end of the two to four weeks, they also, the team also does a sprint review or a sprint demo to the product owner, where they basically talk about what is all deliver, uh, being developed in a sprint, and then they show a demo to the uh, to the product owner. Uh, they they also end or start the next sprint by doing a retrospect or lessons learned, where they basically talk about what are the things that went well, what are the things that did not go well, and also some of the improvement areas that they would want to see in the next set of iterations. So this is a kind of a mechanics of Scrum. Uh, I'll drill down more when we talk about in the during set of uh, discussions. Uh, one of the things that I just talked about was. Bringing change, uh, embracing change is, is, is great uh, in Scrum and Agile. And, uh, but I think we have to be very careful when we are kind of uh, doing this because a lot of times, a lot of clients, they kind of, uh, they don't understand the, the, the whole mechanics of Scrum and, and also bringing in change within a project. So uh, uh, one of the things that, that, that I would like to drill down is uh, change is great, change, embracing change is great in Scrum, uh, but change within a sprint is not allowed. I think that's a message that we have to keep educating uh, the customers or all the practitioners that were, who are part of the Scrum. Uh, uh, this is typically true because we have a shorter iteration of two to four weeks, and uh, we have to be very careful in controlling change within this iteration. Uh, when I when I say changes, I'm talking about major changes which impact which will impact your iteration. So this is very important to uh, to keep in mind and also educate the customer repeatedly. Uh, the 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 the, uh, the one of the other thing is uh, the iteration cycle of two or three or four weeks that you choose that uh, would also be determined uh, by how frequently the change is coming to your project. So so choose your iteration based on frequency of changes that you are getting. I would be talking more during the course of the session. Uh, so what makes a development process scrum? How is it different from a waterfall model or other set of models that we have seen? Uh, it's a very highly iterative development approach. Each iteration delivers a working software. I develop software, and I am able to show it to the product owner and get feedbacks, and it's a potentially shippable product. Uh, the phases in each of the iterations are nearly concurrent, which means that uh, all my SDLC phases, starting from requirement analysis, uh, design, development, coding, uh, testing, ad hoc testing, manual testing, automation testing, uh, release engineering, deployment, daily builds, all are part of a single iteration which happens concurrently. It's not that there is a sequence of activity that happens, it all happens parallelly, uh, depending upon the project, of course. 
The team uses specific engineering practices to keep the code base fresh and flexible. I'll be talking more about it during the course of the discussion. But typically, uh, the engineering practices that we follow in Scrum is continuous integration or J units or refactoring or test driven development and things like that, which basically ensures that my code base is highly fresh. It's kind of not broken. The daily builds are coming out through a continuous integration of my uh, code base, which happens either uh, through a kind of a, a local server or through a remote server like Bamboo, and it's highly flexible. Uh, teams are very highly self-managing. Uh, they take the ownership of the deliveries. They, they commit for the deliverables, which happens in Scrum. So there is a lot of self-managing, uh, 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 which happens within the team. Uh, but one thing to keep in mind, uh, a new team, uh, which has just started uh, Scrum, there is a lot of coaching which is required uh, for a new team because transition from a kind of a highly uh, noise to a mature scrum team is is not as it's a journey it's not a kind of a quick uh, uh, return so uh, we have to keep coaching the teams we have to keep leading the teams and uh, bring in the culture of best practices of scrum uh, the scrum development process is also to uh, about eliminating waste as much as possible whenever it's possible so when i said eliminating waste we talk about uh, we're only building software or building features what is required by the customer or which are prioritized by the customer. We are kind of doing a lot of refactoring within the, uh, the code continuously so that we uh, uh, make sure that the uh, code base is highly maintainable, highly reusable. One thing to keep in mind, it's important that we have a concept of refactoring and eliminating concept, eliminating waste because I have only two to four weeks of iteration where majority of the things have to happen highly efficiently. So one of the one of the mandate or one of the mandate that or a chapter that should be given or that the team should always have is how to continuously improve uh, during these shorter iterations because the margin of error uh, is, is very less. So I should have various mechanisms to increase the efficiency, increase productivity, increase the uh, possibility of eliminating waste, increase the usage of reusability, modularity in my code base and things like that. Uh, uh, we also talk about a, a development process where we're talking about a highly cross-functioning feature teams. Uh, those were the days where we're talking about, uh, you know, what for models where we had skills and everybody would be working according to their skills. One of those days, we're talking about a cross-functioning team in Scrum where uh, we build, uh, we talk about team skills here. We talk about picking up new skills within the team, uh, picking up or working on modules or layers of software across rather than just working on a UI layer or a uh, a business layer or a, or, a, or a persistence layer or a set of modules which a particular team members work on. That's not, that's not uh, a typical uh, you know, culture that you would see in a development, development process in Scrum. We're talking about a cross-functioning feature teams in a, in a Scrum and which, is, which, which works very well, uh, even motivating the team members and working across modules. Code refactoring is something that I just talked about. And we also talk about other set of practices like peer reviews and prior programmings, which basically is tied directly to the code, code quality. Uh, uh, as I just said, uh, uh, the one of the concepts is eliminating waste as much as possible. And one of the mechanisms by which we eliminate waste or increase the code quality is doing a lot of reviews of peer reviews of peer programmings where we, uh, we uh, uh, detect the issues or the uh, problem areas very early during the sprint cycle rather than uh, doing it towards late in the, uh, late in the sprint cycle or do it, uh, late in the release cycle. Uh, we also are talking about a highly tool-based approach where uh, there are a lot of tools that need to be used being a shorter iteration as I just talked about where it's important that we kind of have all these tools built in within my dev process like auto build, deployments, uh, you know, code coverage uh, built into the continuous integration process my J units uh, part of the development process where uh, the visibility to the uh, to the entire team is quicker and uh, problem solving could be much easier while I'm actually part of the sprint cycle. Uh, the other important factor is also building component based or framework based architecture. Nothing nothing specific to Scrum. Uh, it's more to do with the design, but then it's much more important to do than Scrum because it's a shorter iteration uh, and uh, and it's important that whatever we build or whatever we design, it's kind of very highly modularized so that we could actually reuse uh, the architectural components across uh, Sprint and across and it also becomes highly maintainable. 
why Scrum? A lot of, lot of uh, reasons. Uh, it helps to reduce time to market and time to value. It's highly based on value added development. It's highly based on uh, what customer needs at the end of the day. I'm not developing something that uh, that is not needed by the customer. It's something that the product owner says or prioritizes uh, according to his release plan, and that's what I build. So, and it's also faster. Uh, it, it reduces the time to market because I'm actually releasing the software every two or four iterations. I'm building a potentially shippable product. Uh, this is highly useful in a case where you're actually frequently demoing to the customer. So I'm actually releasing uh, uh, iterative uh, incremental updates to the uh, to the uh, to the product, and it helps the demo, uh, you know the team or the sales team to to demo features very quickly. So that also is a kind of a value add uh, feature that I give uh, in this increased uh, development speed. Uh, as we just talked about in terms of continuous integration or J units usage. Uh, and uh, customer collaboration being a kind of a key thing in this and also a focus effort within a sprint, my speed of development is also faster because I'm actually looking at eliminating waste, uh, increasing the efficiency, building, uh, uh, having a very highly focused effort on a two to four weeks instead of a kind of a bigger picture, uh, right, working on a kind of lot of modules and things like that. So it also increases my development speed within a, within a sprint. Greater responsiveness to customers' requests and change. As I said, uh, one of the key premise or kind of key objective of uh, agile methodology, using of agile methodology, is embracing change, and it brings a lot of value to the business very quickly. Uh, that's that's one of the things that you see. Uh, you you develop a software, customer is able to do it, and then he also is able to give you your feedback. as a kind of a big win-win win situation for both the vendor and the customer. Increased quality. A uh, lot of the principles like refactoring, pair programming. J units, uh, automations, integrated testing effort uh, within a, within a uh, sprint cycle, uh, software that meets the business needs better. All of these factors that we just talked about is kind of adds on to a kind of a building of high quality software at the end of the day. Uh, main, uh, one of the main uh, important things that I want to talk about is you're building a kind of software iteratively and you're testing the software iteratively continuously which obviously brings in huge uh, uh, value in terms of quality and customer satisfaction. Reduced wastage, as we just talked about, Scrum teams most of the time are always looking up uh, opportunities to increase efficiency at all layers of SDLC. Uh, also early detection and cancellation of any failing products, right? We build products, we take a course, uh, we do a license run and quickly ch uh, change our direction. Uh, and uh, quickly adapt to the situation helps in reducing waste. We don't build anything for two to three months and then later on realize that it's not required. We do it in a two to four weeks of iteration. Better predictability and adaptability. We talk about story points which will turn it on during the course of action during the discussion and we talk about story points, velocities and burn down charts. Uh, small set of metrics which kind of bring in predictably and adaptably quickly to all the stakeholders who are involved in the projects. Uh, it also brings in uh, high team morale, motivated teams, uh, uh, because there is a lot of ownership uh, of the team because they commit to the deliverables, they own the deliverables, and uh, there is also a software that is built at the end of the at the end of two to week, four weeks of iteration. Uh, as we just talked about, it's highly value driven, knowledge based, and responsive development. It's not based on building just for the sake of building. It's highly uh, 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 customer collaborated. Uh, a driven development approach and it's highly knowledge based approach because there is a lot of collaboration which is involved and it's also highly responsive because you are kind of responding to the changes, you're also adapting to the changes of the customer's need. Some of the other side benefits include, uh, as we just talked about, team satisfaction is huge, morale of the team is huge, uh, uh, some of the negatives also I would be talking about during the course of the discussion. Uh, team is aware of the product, aware of the business much more than it used to be in earlier because they have a bigger picture of all the areas, all the product that they are working on. And also reduce costs because uh, we work on only things that need to be built, not on other uh, things that need not uh, go into the code. Uh, what are the change required to adapt to the Scrum? Uh, we need a customer uh, buy-in uh, first. As I say, customer collaboration is highly important. We need uh, uh, larger teams must be broken into smaller ones. Uh, uh, some of the premises that we need a smaller size of sprint uh, teams, not bigger ones. We have to break the entire team and then form multiple teams instead of a bigger teams because it's, it becomes easy to manage them and easy to control them. Functional silos have to be broken down uh, at least weekend, as we just talked about. We need cross-functional teams, not just individual skills and in individual function modules and things like that. 
people should be working across modules and across layers of software, and that's the culture that 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 is that that Scrum talks about. Uh, we also talk about specialists have to pick up new skills, as we just talked about, uh, uh, like concept of business analysts or DBs and all those guys. They uh, should be able to pick up new skills within a part of the Scrum because the older set of skills might not work. So there should always be kind of a brainstorming session in terms of what are those new skills that they can actually bring in and then bring in value to within the Scrum team. Uh, team must learn to self-manage and ma the managers must learn to lend them. That's important. Uh, we are talking about a highly mature team uh, who are able to self-manage them. We're also talking about managers who are not micromanaging things, rather facilitating or controlling or self-leading, leading the team rather than uh, uh, micromanaging the team. A uh, lot of activities have to be automated because we are talking about efficiency in Scrum. Uh, that is something that uh, a change which is required might not be true in other cases because we have ample time and ample time to react. The reaction time here is, uh, uh, is less. Uh, uh, as we just talked about, managers need to facilitate and not micromanage. That's important. Kind of a mindset change that happens and it, it kind of a very challenging uh, when people come from a waterfall model to a Scrum model and this is something that there are a lot of conflict which happens, which I have seen. Uh, empowered team, we are talking about a highly empowered team. Team is what is important. I will just talk about the last uh, point. Team, team, team is what is important rather than individuals, individual tasks, individual goals. Uh, so so uh, uh, that, that, those are set of the changes that we require while we are adopting Scrum. It's very important that we kind of uh, keep these principles in mind and then bring in that transition when we are talking about transitions. Uh, important thing where a lot of people have talked about where exactly Scrum is most suitable, uh, right? We are talking about a uh, project with some degree of uncertainty, uh, typically a product development uh, around requirements of technology. We are talking about R&Ds, things like that, where Scrum is highly uh, suitable. Projects which are demanding strict hierarchical uh, organization uh, structure uh, uh, might not be suitable for Scrum. Project with team made up of inexperienced associate might not be suitable. Uh, projects that aren't too big or too small, we're talking about a very highly balanced kind of a team where uh, Scrum will be suitable. I would also be talking about where uh, we could also adopt hybrid kind of Scrum where it would kind of uh, would be scaled across other organizations where these set of parameters might not be suitable. And so we're talking about a kind of a, a contextual adoption of Scrum which I'll be touching upon very soon. Uh, uh, projects with buying from team members, business stakeholders and managers as we just talked about. Buying from all the stakeholders is very important to implement Scrum. So those are the areas or those are the projects where Scrum would be kind of preferable or suitable. Co-located project teams with business customers is very important. Uh, but we also know the reality that uh, teams these days are not co-located. We are talking about distributed teams. So I will be touching upon what are the ground rules, how we can actually tweak this, uh, uh, some of the or bring in some of the best practices where uh, teams are not co-located and the customers are not co-located and how we still can actually implement Scrum. Uh, projects using modern languages and tools, uh, as we got talked about, tools, uh, 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 languages which are kind of bring in a new set of views, very modularization, customization, efficiency increases, you know, highly important for, for, for Scrum. So projects which use them would be logically uh, easy to move or transition to Scrum. Projects with no tight budget and schedule are highly suitable for uh, Scrum. Projects that demand a high level of process adherence uh, 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 might not be kind of uh, suitable for Scrum. Uh, also, uh, typically, projects not in the maturity phase of the life cycle, uh, like maintenance and support, also might not be suitable for Scrum. Uh, 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 those projects which are uh, you know developed from scratch, which are products which are developed from scratch, which are early in the growth phase of the life cycle, are a typical candidate for being used in Scrum. But the other thing where uh, uh, the, the school of thought is also talking about how do we actually in this quadrant or uh, in the other uh, uh, image that, that I've just shown where uh, uh, you know across various parameters like culture, dynamism, criticality, size of the team, personal, uh, how we can actually uh, bring in an agile or a Scrum framework when uh, they are not following the basic method of set of uh, you know, ground rules that are typically required for Scrum. So we're talking about conceptual adoption of Scrum in these cases. Uh, I would I would uh, drill down now to the case study. Uh, typically, when we started, majority of the customers that we have interacted with uh, 
uh, this is this is how their landscape is where we have a team size of 10 to 20, the product management is on-site, PM is offshore, development is offshore, QA is offshore and support is offshore. So, so this is the typical landscape that we have and various challenges that the teams have talked about is they don't have predictability, there are a lot of un uncertain requirements, and frequent changes to the requirements, there is a lot of collaboration, people work in silos, team has uh, very little involvement in committing to deliverables, lack of ownership is, is a huge problem. Absence of custom feedback very frequently. Customer collaboration is not happening. Uh, release is failing during UAT. So we release something during the UAT because the customer has never seen the product before and suddenly we see that the UAT is, is failing. Low morale within the team because of lack of ownership, because of lack of empowerment within the team. No sense of achievement uh, because they get to see the working software very late. So so that is another problem that or the challenge that people have faced with projects have faced. And majority of the decisions are made by the on-site product management team. So there is a lot slower turnaround time. So the, the cycle, delivery cycle becomes very slow. So this is this is the landscape, this is the environment, this is these are some of the challenges we had actually seen when we had actually transitioned uh, uh, projects uh, to Scrum from an older methodology. Uh, Typical transformation process that we suggest uh, uh, go through kind of a, a cycle of five steps. Uh, we have a discovery phase, we have a planning phase, we have an enablement phase, we have a pilot phase, and then we have a roll-up phase. Uh, so, uh, uh, you know, in a discovery assessment phase, what we do is a kind of a due diligence. So we kind of sit with the team, understand what their existing system is, what are the sample deliverables that they have, what are the tools that they use, what are the existing processes, what are the set of teams that they have, what is the mixture of teams, what is the team size, what are the various project types and things like that. Uh, so so and here we also talk about what kind of stakeholders that we have and uh, we really have a management body when we're actually bringing or trying to bring a transition to the Scrum. Uh, we also have a kind of a lot of tools where we kind of have a set of questionnaires around Agile Scrum methodology or development where we have certain 10 questions or 15 questions around the basic principles of Scrum, where we rate the projects on 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 a scale of one to five, and then finally see that what is the uh, 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 assessment of each of these products, and then are they really uh, kind of adaptable to, or uh, can they can they really transition to a Scrum, and what are the things we need to do to transition them to the Scrum? Uh, so these are some of the steps that we do uh, in discovery or assessment phase and uh, which also helps us to actually plan or identify some of the risks or, uh, in adopting uh, Agile Scrum. The next step would be the planning phase where we actually build the entire building blocks together to get ready to Scrum and we talk about all the plans, what are the various things that we need to do in terms of process, in terms of implementations, how do we kind of devise the right set of Agile methodology as we just talked about, right? A lot of times, uh, a lot of projects might not be directly or logically uh, be eligible to be transitioned to Scrum. So, do we can we follow a vanilla uh, Scrum uh, model for those projects, or do we need to bring in a kind of a hybrid model for those set of projects? Is what we do in this planning phase. Uh, obviously, the inputs for all of these would be the assessment phase that we had done before. So, all those set of artifacts would be useful here to build in a kind of or device a strategy to come out with the right set of agile methodology. Uh, 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 so the so, so this is what we do in in kind of planning phase. Uh, the next phase will be the enablement phase, where we actually talk about how do we enable uh, and start uh, uh, you know building teams or bringing in the uh, transition or implementing the transition. Right. So we identify the team is the first step. Uh, we bring in all the roles uh, within the team. Uh, we also talk about trainings where uh, we have done where we talk about a basic uh, training of one day. Uh, about Scrum and we also do a Scrum Master training for all those people who are kind of transitioning from the project manager to the Scrum Master. So this also talks about, you know, uh, you know how do we kind of bring in uh, the con a culture of concept of the principles of Scrum and also a concept of the transition from a typical project manager to a Scrum Master in a Scrum. Uh, we also do have done field trips to selected individuals to visit other mature Scrum teams which we have done. Uh, and uh, this is kind of a workshop that we do where we talk about real-time cases uh, where people who are already following Scrum uh, and have mature teams, uh, the transitioning teams could actually uh, see and then uh, actually see what, what's working and what's not working. Uh, 
know, the other set of things that we also do enable is communication channel is very important as I just talked about. Collaboration communication becomes very important. So we also talk about how do we kind of create these communication channels uh, within the Scrum, what are the various stakeholders and how do we build these communication channels. During this process, we also get our product backlogs uh, ready. We also have product owners. We talk about release planning. We also talk about backlogs. We also talk about those set of items that are kind of prerequisites when initiating a project. During this phase, we also talk about what tool we should be using uh, for Scrum, uh, for agile uh, methodology for the build uh, or continuous integration for release management or release engineering and for uh, for other uh, set of SDLC activities like dev and QA. We also talk about what is sprint length. Uh, I'll be talking about this during the course of the time. Uh, and uh, what is it? Is it two weeks or is it three weeks or is it four weeks? And uh, then the other set of things that we would talk, be talking about, what are the various metrics that we need to collect and uh, what, is, what, is, what are the various meetings and what are the various processes that we need to follow within Scrum if we really need to tweak around any of the processes if it's required because uh, it's possible that the project might not be following a one-year uh, Scrum. Uh, then we go on to a pilot phase where we take up a, one or two projects where we start uh, 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 working on a pilot sprint and then see how it works and then we start retrospects and all those things and then finally get a feedback in terms of what worked well and what did not and then start improvising on all those aspects and then start rolling out which is what this last step where we start rolling out uh, onto the entire uh, set of uh, uh, an offer center or a set of which we can actually scale it to the entire organization uh, to transition from uh, typically uh, what for other set models to scrap. Uh, some put for thought which we need to keep in mind, transition analysis consequences, it's very important that we understand these consequences. Uh, it's not a silver bullet, so it has to be very contextual uh, when you're adopting a scrum. Uh, as he said, uh, the projects might not be suitable, so you have to adopt to uh, according to your context. It's not easy, but you have to give time, uh, don't expect results very quickly, it takes time to, to bring in a mindset change, bring in a culture, bring in the post principles in place uh, uh, and things like that because all these uh, meetings that we talk about, all these, these are all certain based on certain set of time boxed meetings. So uh, we're not used to the big meetings. So there is a lot of mindset and cultural change we can talk about and needs to be baked uh, and there has to be a gestation period to, for people to, to adopt or people to get, to get accustomed to this. Take time to think about our uh, practices and why they exist. It's important because you have to bring in the culture within your team. So it's important that everybody talks about in the same language. Executive commitment is very critical. Uh, top management is very important. Be more clear about what the agile rules are. Uh, focus on principles over mechanics. It's important that we understand the principles rather than mechanics. As he said, a panina scrum might not be suitable, but then still some of the principles still would hold true when you're actually building a hybrid model. Focus on automation. Increase efficiency as much as possible. Focus on early feedback and collaboration. Focus on team, not individuals. Uh, and institutionalize the culture of agile or scrum and build enterprise agility. Uh, so. First do it, then do it right, and then do it fast. That's the that's mantra that typically a transition should have. Uh, and this takes a good amount of period uh, from for a team who's starting on there to become a mature team. Uh, typical release cycle, uh, you know, we have various iterations uh, where we do uh, every iteration uh, happens, which we call it a sprint. And ultimately, we do have a release sprint where basically we freeze the code and then start doing a lot of uh, other set of testing, and then finally we do a release. Uh, so this is something that we follow, uh, and I have been following it uh, wherever I have transitioned uh, uh, kind of, uh, to Scrum. Uh, working on a Scrum team, representation across all roles, as we just said, there are no functional roles. There are representation, it's a team which is important, so that we have all kinds of representation, whole team part of the iteration planning. Estimates are not done by the project managers. Estimates or planning is done by the entire team. The entire team owns comments to a particular release. Your work is a user story, includes acceptance criteria. I'll be talking about these things during the course. Uh, uh, release planning, uh, it involves all stakeholders. Uh, it helps set goals for the development. Uh, uh, typically, for two weeks sprint length, it's just a release for every three sprints. And uh, for, a, for a sprint length, which is a one week, we typically say that the release can happen in four to six sprints. Again, can vary. This is something that we have benchmarked according to our uh, uh, calibrated data, but it could vary according to the projects. Uh, final output of release plan is we have release plan feature stories, and we also have estimates for all these uh, backlogs that we have. Uh, during the release, uh, 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 you know, iteration that we just talked about uh, during the last phase, uh, uh, you know, we spent a lot of time actually stabilizing the code and also get ready for that final release or a general expect, uh, acceptance. 
uh, for the products. Uh, so typically, the activity that we do during a release sprint is do a stability testing, a performance testing, end-to-end -end regulation testing, a system testing. We do a user acceptance testing. We fixing and testing those high priority issues. We do a certification testing. We do kind of environmental testing. Uh, and we also kind of, this is the time where we kind of do a go and over decision with the stakeholders and finally release the product. Uh, so this could be as I said, it could be a, uh, after, after the release could happen after uh, every three sprints for a two week sprint length or it could be a four to six sprints for a one week sprint length. It all depends. Uh, uh, domain maps, scoping uh, within a story which we have used is kind of domain map that we have used uh, which kind of has worked uh, for me during the past. Uh, domain map which basically has a set of user stories, which user stories are nothing but the set of use cases that I have, uh, function use cases that I kind of put it in a domain map across the function modules and then prioritize it. So uh, when we talk about user story, a story is considered to be a good story. When it's independent, it's negotiable, it's estimable, it's small and testable. So this is kind of a, a ground rule that we talk about when we kind of create user stories. User stories should not be created for everything and anything. It has that sort of set of goals. Every user story or use case has certain goals and we should be kind of careful in creating those. So uh, a domain map, this typically a domain map, that's how it looks like where uh, I just used kind of a, a sample where uh, all the modules or the epics or the functionalities, I kind of uh, group it together. I have use cases that are part of a major set of use cases or user stories which are part of these modules. And I also have on the right hand side where I prioritize all these use cases and accordingly I kind of plan my release. Uh, again, the main map could be prepared based on what are the must-have features or what are the kind of nice-to-have features and what are the kind of stretch features. And that is what I think I'm mentioning at the end where it talk about tables, nuggets, and drops. So it all depends upon how you want to call it. But this is something that I normally that I have used, which is more for must-haves, uh, nice-to-haves, and then uh, uh, good-to-haves. Uh, sprint. Uh, for an increased feedback cycle, it's recommended to have a sprint in the one week for a co period. Uh, one week is good enough, but then uh, typically we have a distributed uh, team and uh, normally uh, the standard or an average uh, that I have worked with is a two-week sprint, but that's not the ground rule. It could vary depending on the project. Uh, it's beneficial that all teams working on the same release where they follow the same sprint schedule. It's important that there is a kind of a, a consensus across the sprint cycle or a sprint schedule that we follow because finally the sprints would finally yield the release. So it's important that we follow these. If there are multiple teams working on uh, to achieve a particular release, it's important that everybody follows a certain release schedule instead of following a kind of a half as that. One is following a one week, other is following a two weeks, another third one team is following a three weeks. That's, that has not worked. Uh, uh, it's also suggested that instead of create most teams, instead of creating a huge team size, the ground rule is have a team of around 7 to 10 people in a team. Uh, and if you have more team members, do split your teams and then have multiple scrum teams. Uh, also, uh, sprint length decision would depend upon a lot of factors. It depends upon the team size. What do you want to deliver at the end of the, the can you deliver a potentially shippable product at the end of the uh, release? Do you have a co-located or a distributed team? What is the length of the release? What is the amount of complexity and the uncertainty you have? How long the priorities case is? All these factors would depend upon you, would kind of desire your sprint length. So it depends upon your project, it depends upon your kind of environment, uh, uh, which would kind of drive your sprint length. There are no hard and fast rules, but typically the, the vanilla scrum would say that it's from two to four weeks, but then it could vary depending upon your, your kind of environment. Sprint planning, the entire team is involved. Uh, typically, uh, it starts with a sprint zero, where you kind of uh, have a uh, POC stage, where you kind of assess your uh, initiation, assess your infrastructure, assess your kind of features, build your tools and all those things. This is what we do in Sprint Zero. Then we also, the Sprint Zero, we also develop our product backlog and release backlog before we actually start our implementation sprints. Uh, and uh, that's what we do. In Sprint planning, uh, it, it's a meeting which is done by, uh, it's collaborative effort. Uh, everybody gets involved, the entire team gets involved. They, prior, uh, they work on or they, they work on the product backlog or the sprint back, the product backlog that is given to them by the product owner and then start kind of uh, breaking down into individual tasks and then see how, how they can come it. It's important to know that uh, the concept of team and the team culture is actually coming uh, and has to be built across each of these planning meetings because this is where the culture is uh, brought in. So when you're talking about a sprint planning meeting, it's important that everybody understand that the team is what is important. They actually come into deliverables and uh, uh, it's, it's team commitment which is important instead of individual deliveries. Uh, 
uh, typically various things are followed. It's, it's, uh, there are two things that we do uh, in a planning meeting also where we actually do a pre-planning meeting with the product owner. We understand the stories for the upcoming sprints and uh, we also do it at the start of the sprint where we actually spend time on understanding deeper into the stories and then start breaking down the stories into individual uh, tasks and also estimate each of these tasks and finally do a comment. Uh, so this is this is what uh, 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 you know my experience has been around following it. Sprint execution, uh, they, uh, they kind of as we talked about, right, uh, perform continuous refactoring, uh, uh, and uh, there is a lot of continuous integration. Uh, SPIN check-ins and all those things are very important. There is a mandate that uh, the check-in should happen very quickly, and they should get tracked, and the daily bill has to be in place where any kind of errors that comes up, every entire team member knows, and then the daily build fix issues is quickly fixed. Also, the J units, uh, pair programming, and then pair reviews is also made, becomes very important in their process, which increases your efficiency and quality. Uh, QA uh, becomes an important, or a kind of a gatekeeper, uh, uh, very, becomes very important during Scrum. Uh, they do a lot of things during this, during this iteration of a two to four weeks, where they kind of develop the functional test components, they uh, execute the test cases, they do ad hoc testing, they exploratory testing, they do race, retest and closed effects, they approve the stories, do a lot of early testing. So there is a lot of emphasis on, uh, and then obviously the automation. So there is a lot of emphasis on kind of raising defects and then bringing all those defects very quickly into the, uh, to the surface so that the quality is improved. Uh, they also do performance regression testing during the sprint cycle depending upon what feature that they are developing. Uh, I'll also be touching upon an other set of meetings that we have where we talk about daily scrum meetings, which happens every day with the entire team. Uh, it typically should happen 15 minutes. Uh, everybody works on three questions, what they did yesterday, today, and tomorrow, and, uh, and what are the things that are actually blocking them in terms of executing or going forward. Typically, no discussion conversation should happen outside of the project. Uh, it should not be a kind of a, a status meeting. Uh, it should be more of a kind of completion meeting. On where are we in terms of completion, and uh, and that short that's that's what should be the focus point instead of conflicts and other set of discussion that we should have. Time we should time box it for 15 minutes instead of taking it away. Any kind of other discussion should be offline. Uh, sprint retrospective, heart of the uh, Scrum process. Basically, we discuss about what's working, what's not working, what could actually work better. The entire team gets involved. They own the uh, kind of retrospective. They talk about. Uh, various factors in terms of how did the delivery go, what was the collaboration, how was the collaboration with the team, what was the co communication uh, uh, factor, how was the release and how was the quality, how, what was the schedule, did we do it better, was the quality better, did we have more set of issues, was the collaboration better, are there any team needs specifically, are there any team issues, process issues, so a gamut of things that they actually talk about in the Scrum, not just the delivery, which is what is kind of a mandate that when, when it's facilitated by a Scrum Master. Typically, it should be 30 to 45 minutes, uh, and uh, and it should be, again, time box so that people don't spend too much, but it should be very effective where we talk about what's working, what's not working, and what other things we can actually improve with certain set of action items for each individual. Uh, don't skip it for the first few sprints because it's important to identify what the issues are, how the team is performing, and also learn continuously. Uh, so the first few retrospects are very important when we are actually transitioning or starting a new Scrum process. Uh, why, does, why do we do a retrospect? We've talked about this to gain more visibility to continuously improve, so I'm just going to kind of run down on it. Uh, we now come to a sprint verification cycle where we actually come to a cycle where we kind of give demo to the product owner in terms of what are the user stories that we have finished. So, uh, uh, so we go through a demo, we have a definition of done checklist. So we, uh, this checklist is typically known as a definition of done where it's customized for each project, for each enterprise. Uh, and finally, uh, we kind of have this checklist and uh, uh, which is agreed upon by the product manager saying that whether a particular feature or user story is done or not based on the checklist that I'm actually kind of signing off with the product owner. Uh, again, very customizable, so it depends upon the project. Sprint retrospection, whether being retrospect, which is, as, as I said, the heart of the Scrum process. Majority of the things break and make and break in this process, so it's important that everybody follows the sprint retrospection. A lot of teams that I have seen uh, kind of kind of very uh, lackadaisical in this area where they're kind of very, very focused on delivery, but the retrospection does not happen. 
uh, I, I think I think we should be moving away if we ever see kind of an indication of preterite perfection not being uh, uh, happening. Uh, some of the metrics I'll be talking about this. Uh, this is a typical agile project management tool that I have used, and which is a rally, which kind of gives you a good one, which talks about how we kind of structure the entire uh, story, epic stories, and also start uh, collaborating. Uh, you know, the entire team collaborates uh, uh, using the tool. Uh, Scrum metrics, very, very lightweighted. We talk about story points for each stories. Uh, and some of the story points uh, that I have actually covered or which has been accepted by this product owner is what uh, would define a velocity. It's kind of a simple metric that I have. It also gives me a mechanism to uh, see what is my productivity. So if, say, for example, in in this particular case where uh, I start a sprint, I have a velocity of around 5. Uh, but since I have a lower product knowledge, a lower domain knowledge, or no technology knowledge, my initial phases of the sprint would typically have a lower velocity. But as I progress uh, and become a mature team to understand more of the product, more of the domain, more of the technology, my velocity of productivity increases. So it's a good mechanism to, to see how your velocity is increasing and how your team is performing. And uh, it's a clear cut indication of uh, productivity in your team. Burn down chart, uh, everyday progress, I, I see it using this chart where it basically tells me what is remaining to get completed during a sprint, not what is completed. So every day, uh, an indication of a downward trend uh, uh, consistently would tell me that we are progressing uh, nicely. But a case is where it has a very staggered graph uh, would tell me that there are a lot of problems, a lot of uncertainty which is going on, and team is facing a lot of issues where you have to go and then begin and then facilitate. Uh, also, uh, during the initial phases of the sprint, you would see the graph is uh, very kind of skewed, uh, and it's kind of not consistently uh, going down. But that's, as I said, it's mainly because uh, you honor a lot of uh, issues, you honor a lot of uncertainties, and then you get to know that your, your original planned uh, estimate might not be due. You start increasing your actual effort or the remaining effort. That's the reason why your graph is changing. Uh, risk management process, uh, nothing different from a typical project management process, but then I just want to drill down that. There are two levels of risk management uh, that happens in an agile. One is the, the at level of project level risks, where we talk about what are the various risks at the project level. But then we also have to talk about risk of the iteration level, which could be at the level of product backlogging in, the, in terms of requirements, in terms of stories, in terms of uh, uncertainties in, ter in terms of collaboration, in terms of brainstorming within the iteration. So typically when you're doing a risk management process, we should keep in mind that we have to break this risk management process to a project level risk management and also the iteration level risk management, which kind of has worked that I have seen uh, in a Scrum model. Uh, agile estimation practice, practice best practices. Uh, some of the estimation practices still holds true that are not going to change, but then we have to keep in mind some of the other, other things which are kind of true for Agile estimation to improve upon. Use more than one person, nothing specific for Agile, but then it's much more important because we are doing a shorter iteration. Use more than one approach, sometimes it might have to be done uh, depending upon the customer's uh, 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 nature and, and their sensitivities. Agree on what is done and what is not done. As you just said, definition of done becomes my important checklist. I'm actually uh, even breaking on a task. So when I when you're actually doing an estimates, make sure that you have your definition of done in front of you, and then all your tasks are actually broken down to cater to the definition of done checklist that you have. So it becomes easier for you to one uh, make sure that whatever you're finally finishing it matches your definition of done, and you've not missed any of the items that are part of the definition of done. Also, it, it's important that you're actually giving a realistic estimates because you're including all the realistic set of tasks that are required to complete your set of stories. Uh, uh, some of the other important, uh, so get insights through retrospective. As I say, a lot of times estimates are kind of becomes a bottleneck for you. So get insights. Do talk about estimates in your uh, and improve upon those because you get time instead of you know. And since the team is owning and the team is going to actually ex execute and also are going to tell you what the estimates are, it's important that you actually gain insights during your retrospects and then understand and continuously improve on your estimates. And uh, as any estimates, these are estimates, these are not, uh, uh, you know, uh, predictions. So do review, do keep revisiting, uh, do involve multiple people, not just one guy, and then keep repeating uh, the same set of process and then keep improving upon your uh, 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 estimating process as a progressive elaboration. Uh, communication and collaboration becomes very, very important. If 
factor uh, for executing or critical success factors. A lot of things we have used. Uh, Wiki is a very, very important tool that typically a lot of companies use uh, for bringing in a collaborative. Uh, most of the discussion that happens, it happens through Wiki, whether you're talking about a, a meetings, minutes of meeting, or we're talking about design documents, or we're talking about uh, other set of di discussion that we have. So everything happens through Wiki, which we have done it. And it, it a typically mature Scrum team uh, is some uh, is a team where uh, 90, 80 to 90 percent of the interactions or collab or uh, communication happens through Wiki. That's when we talk about a, a mature Scrum team. Uh, Jira or any other tool that we have, which kind of an agile project manager or a rally that we can use. Webex and recordings. A lot of times, a newcomers into the Scrum team, Webex and recordings have worked to bring in a quick uh, uh, you know, context to the entire project under the entire, and since we are talking about, so we can actually increase the productivity of team members by using these video conference and work depending upon the projects, phone calls as usual, Skypes, uh, meeting between product owner and the team frequently or during these meetings that we have, round back sessions. A lot of times, a uh, lot of knowledge which kind of remain, remains across the team, so it's also important to do a lot of round back sessions and then continuously get people updated on what's working for various teams and what's not working for teams uh, during various uh, uh, forums because it's important that we not only collaborate within the team, it's also important that we collaborate across the teams to achieve a common set of goals. Scrum testing, uh, uh, there's a lot of confusion that I have seen in terms of what we need to test during a Scrum uh, uh, process. A uh, lot of complaints have come in terms of, I have very limited time uh, to test, I would only be doing a function test. So, it's, it's important that we bring in a lot of innovation in testing for a Scrum uh, uh, when we're doing it because we want to increase the recovery, we also inc want to increase the uh, uh, quality of deliverables that go out. So here what we talk about, how important the tools are, how important automations are, where we're talking about automation tools like Selenium and other, any other tools of uh, automation, uh, which becomes very important where we actually are doing a risk-based testing where I would basically concentrate on the high business value test cases rather than concentrating on low priority uh, test cases. So it's important that we have kind of uh, continuously improve on, improving on testing activities. Uh, we are innovating, uh, increasing our efficiencies uh, in, in testing effort uh, to bring in quality and then focus on core testing effort rather than non-core activities. So this, this slide basically projecting what all we should be covering uh, and which are the test cases we should be covering and what are the various strategies that we should be using to cover uh, various set of test cases. For example, if you want to cover the functional tests, uh, story tests, prototypes and simulations, we could actually use a combination of automated and manual testing. Uh, but if you want to do a performance and load testing and security testing, uh, it's better use tools like JMeters or SOAP UIs for web services testing or uh, load runners where uh, uh, manual testing might not help. Uh, in the other quadrant where we have concept of unit tests and component tests where it's easier to use automated uh, tools and help uh, that helps uh, you know testing team to see the integrated te integration testing also done through automation and decrease your time of testing. Scrum in a distributed environment, a lot of ground rules, a lot of people are facing problems that I have talked to and there are certain ground rules that people should keep in mind when they are actually doing Scrum in a distributed environment. It becomes much more difficult. Uh, uh, in a distributed environment, uh, communicate as much as possible. Uh, use processes and tools. It's kind of kind of negative of the typical agile manifesto say, which says that people and processes are more people and interactions are more important than processes and tools. But then, in a distributed environment, we might have to bring in more processes and tools to bridge that distance gap. Uh, uh, avoid information stickiness. Uh, 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 though the, uh, the the team is not co-located, but the information at least should be co-located. So make sure that all your information is co-located at any point in time, and then avoid information stickiness, and then uh, uh, which becomes a bottleneck. Uh, work on related modules and locations. I've seen that when you're working on uh, when you when when you're splitting modules across locations, communication uh, uh, challenges becomes much more uh, uh, difficult. Uh, so it's it's important that we work on related modules from one location, and then the other set of modules can be worked upon by the other locations. It becomes easier. Uh, uh, using daily Scrum and all these meetings very effectively, have set of agendas, have set of uh, agendas for these meetings much in advance, and use you know when you're in a distributed environment, it's important that we are on a call. Use uh, reference points very uh, uh, nicely. Say for example, you're using story, you use ticket numbers, you use description. 
very clearly and you also speak very slowly in these distributed environments because it's important that the, you understand the bigger picture of what the other person is doing instead of just uh, doing a status update. Uh, removing, uh, remove the communication barrier during the meetings, remove the noises, come close to the mics. A lot of times uh, 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 people just talk about in a room uh, without knowing that the other person on the other side is not even able to hear it. So do remove those noise, avoid any off-meeting off discussions digressing from the topics, be focused and uh, as this is a smaller meeting of 15 to, uh, to half an hour being a distributed environment, be focused and don't have off-meeting discussions. Uh, be prepared in, for these meetings in advance. Co-located teams are much easier to, uh, to, to, to communicate because everybody is co-located, it becomes easier, everybody has a context. But if you go in a distributed environment, we have to give the context in advance to everybody who is going to attend this meeting. So be prepared for meetings. Do spend five to ten minutes before going to these meetings. Identify what are the things you have done uh, uh, yesterday, what are the things you are going to do today, and any blockers that you want help on. Be prepared at least five to ten minutes and spend some time before instead of going to uh, these meetings ad hoc. Always communicate with the screen, uh, Scrum team. Uh, make sure the entire Scrum team is involved when you're communicating, not just to individual Scrum master. It's important that you have distribution list where you talk about what are the things you are doing and what are the questions that you have for the, the entire distribution group. Uh, also identify leads. You have to identify leads who are basically going to act as a point of contact across all the environments or the distributed environment because it, it becomes easier to actually consolidate uh, the communication uh, uh, you know, by one person or one lead, and use wiki as much as possible. It's 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 collaborative tools as much as possible because there is nothing like a kind of a uh, 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 a face to face or a uh, communication. But then obviously we kind of have these constraints in a distributed environment. So use wiki, uh, pair people across locations, have video conferencing, do webex as much as possible, and do frequent demo demos. So status updates uh, on its own doesn't work. You have to use more of uh, kind of demos and WebEx. Uh, I would be just uh, uh, drilling down to kind of some of the aspects of uh, you know why what are the pitfalls or anti patterns that I have to be very careful on when we are actually talking about uh, some of the anti patterns that we see is lack of expertise, subject matter expertise. Product owners are not right minded, uh, so we have to be sure that the product owners are very right minded. The lack of mistrust, micromanage, and work assignment. No, no, in an agile or a Scrum model, it's important that we kind of don't have these cultures. Training, coaching, guidance to the team is very important. Don't think that the everything is auto achievable. Uh, Scrum means self organizing, self managing teams. No, uh, initial period they need coaching, they need training, a lot of training. Do spend time. It's not a one uh, day overnight change. It requires a lot of uh, institutionalizing. Uh, Continuing uh, failure, uh, failing to deliver when you committed to deliver is kind of a not good things. So, which means that you're actually not doing a retrospect properly. So, do check that if you're actually following retrospects or not. Lack of cross-functional teams. It's important that you have cross-functional teams in your Scrum. If you don't have it, then your Scrum is, uh, Scrum model is not a scalable model or a sustainable model. So, do look into those. Lack of right-minded product owner. As I said, it's important that product owner has trust. You collaborate with the product owners instead of having a mic probing kind of a product owner to do to make your strategy. If you have a product owner who's kind of very very probing in nature, lack of collaboration. Make sure that's not a lot of lot of times Scrum fail because of collaboration. Impo uh, spend a lot of time on agile practices. Train people repeatedly uh, on agile practices and principles. Big size team in a Scrum team. Do split your team to multiple teams. Don't have big size of teams. Information stickiness, which I just talked about. Co-locate your information if if not the team. Uh, success is not defined and measured. When you you have to measure your success also. Start also building your measurable criteria when you are kind of adopting agile, which could be a questionnaire at the end of the day, end of the uh, or a maturity factor that you can build. So there are a lot of things that we we have done uh, where uh, we have assessed uh, or audited Scrum teams uh, uh, on their maturity. Uh, uh, change is coming very quickly than ever before. Uh, existing rigid mindset about rigid walls. So there are a lot of times mindset change becomes a very very important uh, uh, parameter why uh, Scrum adoption kind of uh, is not embraced very quickly. So spend a lot of time on mindset change. Give some time. Uh, this is where your coaching, guidance, training uh, becomes very important. Uh, also have these principles or all these meetings very very clearly defined, like daily Scrum meetings. Uh, or the retrospect meetings or 
you know, a concept of time boxing every meeting is very important because we spend a lot of time on meetings, but it's so it's important that we time box the meetings and also make it very objective based instead of just running around on various issues which are not relevant uh, uh, to those set of meetings. Uh, I think, I think uh, as I just talked about, it's not a silver bullet and uh, I think I think I would just end my discussion on here. I will be uh, willing to take up any set of questions. I'm hoping that uh, it has uh, kind of uh, given some insights on some of the challenges that people have faced and uh, what are the ways that we can actually do to address those challenges. It's not a, a kind of an overnight change they said, uh, so it, it needs to be baked. Uh, people have to be given time uh, and a set of practices have to be uh, coached and uh, in the in the respective teams so that's that's what my session is all about uh, open for questions thank you the questions are already shared with you Yeah, I think uh, uh, I, I'm seeing a lot of questions in terms of applicability of Agile or Scrum. Uh, I think I just talked about uh, in the initial phases where uh, uh, there are a lot of reservations of uh, using uh, Agile or Scrum, uh, you know, methodologies in larger scale projects, uh, which is where I said that uh, your environment becomes very important. Uh, it's and it's uh, the the vanilla Scrum model might not work, with, which is where a lot of organizations actually are adopting a hybrid kind of a methodology where you are actually uh, uh, take up uh, principles or best practices from these agile and then build your own kind of a methodology or a kind of hybrid methodology, uh, if you will. So, uh, so for example, uh, uh, practices like you know the the refactoring or Building a componentized uh, architecture or doing automation; these are some set of best practices which could hold on any of the methodology. So, uh, so my my answer to that would be that uh, do look at your environment, do look at your challenges, do look at your kind of a, uh, environmental uh, 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 parameters, and based on that, work out and come out with a kind of a methodology which would work uh, for you based on set of best practices around. Uh, so there isn't any hard and fast rule that it might not work or it might not. It, it is a pos it is a, it's a thing of uh, what are the best practices that you can actually take and then imbibe and then build a kind of your own methodology. So uh, so one of the questions around is product backlog and sprint backlog. Uh, the the detailing of these, uh, how much is actually detailed? Uh, all these, I remember one thing that all these uh, use cases that we're talking about, we might not have the entire, you know, system use case uh, uh, at the very start of the sprint. Now we are talking about incremental uh, uh, kind of a, uh, requirements which are coming. So typically, use cases would come. It might not be the uh, entire set of module that we are talking about, but we are building incrementally a particular module. So uh, and how much detail these uh, backlogs and sprint backlogs? Typically, they would be detailed. Uh, uh, to as much as it's implementable, as we just said, that it should be implementable, it should be estimable, and it should also be at the end of the day, use cases should come out, and then you should be able to deliver a potentially shippable product out of it. So, uh, for example, uh, at, uh, creating a design document or creating a uh, document might not be a uh, use case on its own because there is no end result, in it, no end deliverable. But obviously, uh, you know, uh, features which kind of uh, uh, are potentially shippable would would be detailed out in terms of requirement specs. Also, the acceptance criteria becomes also important. Where what is the acceptance criteria that the product owner has set for you, which where he says that this actually story is kind of complete. So, so that was one of the questions.
Yeah. So one of the one of the question is what do, how do I decide the sprint length? Uh, as I just covered in one of the areas, uh, there are various factors uh, which would actually drive your sprint length, uh, your complexity, uh, how much change you're getting, how frequently you're changing, uh, you're you're getting your change. Uh, what is your team size? For example, if you have a size of five people and if you are kind of getting very complex stories and uh, at the end of the two weeks you actually are not able to deliver anything uh, as a shippable uh, uh, product, then it becomes uh, a problem. So all these are factors which kind of drive your sprint length depending upon your team size, depending upon the complexities and all things like that. So do uh, take those parameters into consideration when you're actually deciding your sprint length. It might vary depending upon the project parameters. Yeah. So one of the one of the questions on uh, uh, estimation models, uh, estimation techniques are uh, are nothing different from the usual uh, estimation techniques. We still have the same. It's just that the team gets involved in this. The only one thing that is added onto the estimation is we also have this concept of story points, which we do and size the end, each of the stories that we get using a planning poker. But uh, but bearing that, we still do the work breakdown. Uh, you know, we still have to break the break the entire stories into tasks and estimate each of these tasks. So there is no difference uh, in terms of what the estimation is uh, uh, that we are going to follow. But yes, uh, uh, as any kind of estimate, it's not a prediction, so we still have contentions in terms of what the developer has estimated, and, uh, but we always have, the, since we actually do a sprint planning, we actually drill down and the entire team is involved, the estimates are supposed to be at least close enough to what uh, uh, the, the reality is. In majority of the cases, bearing few of the cases where the uncertainties are huge uh, and there are POCs which you get involved where you actually don't know how to even estimate it. So, so estimating technique doesn't change, it still remains the same, uh, 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 but, but it's, it's the only difference is it's done with the entire team, the ownership is for the entire team to do it and it has to be continuously improved upon. One of the questions is code refactoring, which is an interesting question. Yes, uh, uh, there is a possibility that code refactoring could be done multiple times uh, 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 in, in Sprint, which we have done it. And this is where I think it's important that you have a, you have a good expectation uh, of the client for them. Uh, it's also important that, uh, uh, th which is where I say that it's important that when we are building a product or when we are building a product and designing it, it's important that we kind of modularize it as much as possible that it becomes easily uh, maintainable. So this is a challenge that we have where if the changes are huge and it's coming uh, you know very frequently then uh, uh, then we have to manage these changes in such a way that the, the, the amount of changes or amount of refactoring that we do is, is quite minimal and this can come only if you're actually building a kind of a reusable or a kind of a component based architecture which is kind of a plug and play architecture. So there's a lot of stuff which goes into building these kind of uh, components and architecture where even if you have multiple changes, the maintainability becomes very easy uh, instead of kind of have a very, very tightly coupled uh, kind of a situation. Yeah, one of the question is uh, where is, what type of projects are suitable uh, uh, most of the, there, there isn't hard, I think most of the projects are suitable. Again, as I said, you'll have to tweak around based on your requirement. Uh, but typically, uh, you know, projects or products, uh, uh, it's, it's suitable for products. Then your maintenance or support kind of projects where it's kind of a, in a maturity phase uh, of the life cycle. Then, uh, but then as I said, yeah, I have cases where we are actually following Scrum even for uh, uh, implementation or maintenance kind of a mode where we have tweaked around uh, some of the processes and uh, we are following it. As I said, uh, a hybrid kind of approach where we can actually take the best practices and then build it. And actually, uh, I have seen where it actually has given a lot of predictability to the even maintenance projects compared to like a non-scrum or a non-agile model where predictability was a big uh, uh, cause of concern. So I have teams where people have actually taken up in support and maintenance also where they have moved and taken up scrum best practices. So you could do and then use it and then tweak around what is, is required uh, for your set of projects.
So one of the other things where we talk about, which is the lot of contention is there is, uh, what does this integration testing mean? Integration testing means, uh, and uh, who does this uh, testing? Uh, and uh, things like that. Integration testing means that QA still owns the entire testing, but then they're doing a lot of testing within the sprint where they are actually using a lot of techniques like ad hoc, manual, automated, componentization, uh, using comp uh, you know tools, automated tools to actually do the integration testing. So, so integration testing helps you increase your efficiency. It's still owned. QA still is a gatekeeper uh, for 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 your delivery, so that doesn't change. But actually, he, they do uh, integrate kind of testing. The other important parameter is Dev is also doing a unit testing where they actually cover a lot of scenarios within their kind of unit testing using GA units and all, which also helps in increasing the quality of the product. So that is also part of this iteration. So it becomes important that you bring in all these tools and techniques within the iteration so to increase your quality and also bring in an integrated testing uh, framework. So I think one of the, I, I would probably take one question here. Uh, one of the questions is how does it actually fit into your, you know, the, the, the process-based CMMI models and things like that. A uh, lot of contention here. Uh, again, as I said, I think, I think we, should, we, should, uh, we should just be uh, thinking about, uh, uh, you know, again, you know, the project environment and the set of organizational uh, things. We do have, I have seen projects where uh, people are following a kind of a hybrid model where we still have uh, the basic set of uh, vanilla best practices that we follow for a project, but then we still we also do have uh, we uh, do f uh, follow processes which are actually required for the compliance of these IS and CMMI, like for example metrics or the other set of you know audits or things like that. So those doesn't change. You still uh, the cases where the process adherence is very important. Uh, I think it's important that you kind of take into account all those and then build a framework. Uh, for your own uh, uh, methodology and then bring in some of the best practices. So it's kind of a, uh, as I say, contextual adoption is very important. Uh, uh, vanilla adoption might not work in those cases. So I think I, I would probably end my session. I kind of, I hope that I had answered a few of them. If you have more questions, please uh, write to me on my uh, email address, which is given at the end of the presentation. And I would uh, be willing to take up those. Uh, uh, now we can conclude this session. Thanks, Mr. Deepak, for your informative session on adopting Scrum, a case and study involving transition, implementation, challenges, and benefits. It was indeed an enlightening session. I would also like to thank our participants for their support in making this webinar a huge success. The recording of this webinar will be available on techgig.com by tomorrow. The next session in TechGig webinar series is happening tomorrow, that is, Friday, the 20th of January at 5 p.m. Topic for the webinar is Software Application Lifecycle Management Maturity with Microsoft Visual Studio and Team Foundation Server. We will be having Mr. Sandeep Chanda, Director Solutions at Nudisic as our guest speaker. So see you all tomorrow. Till then, have a nice day. Thank you. <laughs>